So I'm going to uh, use cholera as a model. It's the one I'm particularly interested in studying, but I, I do want to preface by just saying we, we don't really fundamentally understand why certain infections, particularly those that are in the gut and other mucosal surfaces of the body, we don't have adequate vaccines for. Cholera represents an ideal way in which to study that problem, and it's a major public health problem, so those two things come together. So I am going to use cholera as a model, but I hope you can think beyond cholera and how it might be applied to other uh, diseases. Just to put cholera in perspective, uh, childhood diarrhea is a major problem around the world. We, of course, in this country don't have the severity that they do elsewhere, but it's responsible for about 6% of global mortality. And to put that in perspective, 3.1 million uh, deaths a, a year, many of those are children. And children who survive the diarrheal episode uh, have impaired growth and cognitive development, uh, sometimes for life. Vaccines are lacking not just for cholera, but for the other major diseases of the gastrointestinal tract, as well as the urinary tract and the reproductive system and other mucosal sites. So this uh, cholera has acted for some years as a prototypical infection at a site like this, and that's the reason many people, including myself, choose to study it as a model for other reasons, and of course to solve it hopefully in its own right. So the, or, the uh, disease is caused by a bacterium, a gram-negative bacterium called Vibrio cholera, hence the word cholera. It has a polar flagellum that you see sticking out the end there, and it exists in uh, uh, water as a free-living microbe. Um, I'll show you some other forms in, in water in just a moment. The bottom right is just a a picture of some water in Bangladesh, and I'll be returning to Bangladesh and why that's important for study of cholera in just a moment. The outer surface of gram-negative bacteria has a molecule uh, lipopolysaccharide, um, and in that molecule there's a repeating unit that is used serologically to differentiate different uh, bacteria, and particularly uh, serotypes within a particular species. So using that uh, called the O antigen. There are 150 serotypes of cholera, but only two cause substantial human disease. We don't really understand why that is, but I'll return to those in a moment. A couple of words about the epidemiology of cholera, how you get it, where it uh, comes from. Uh, the first serotype identified is the O1 serotype, hence the O1. They're now up to O180 or so. And there are two different biotypes of this. They're a little different clinically, but interestingly, the classical, and you can imagine classical was the first described by the name, has now disappeared from the world and has been replaced uh, by this second biotype, which appeared in the early uh, 1960s. In the early 1990s in Asia, a new serotype emerged called the O139 serotype. And uh, this was derived, we think, from the LTOR01 biotype but uh, people were not cross-immune, so it caused another extensive outbreak of cholera, and there's concern that it may spread worldwide from Asia. But interestingly, just those two serotypes, the O1 and the O139, have been associated at least with epidemic disease. The others do cause a little diarrhea, but nothing of the magnitude of cholera. Cholera is an ancient disease. It certainly goes back thousands of years, but it was confined to the Indian subcontinent until more modern history probably when trade routes were established uh, back primarily to the United Kingdom. And since the 19th century, uh, seven worldwide pandemics, an epidemic is an outbreak of ma major magnitude in a localized area, pandemic uh, much more extensive in, in unrelated areas. Seven pandemics have started in Asia and then spread around the world. We were involved in the US through the first six of those, but thankfully have not been involved in the seventh pandemic. Cholera is a disease with a lot of history. Uh, John Snow, uh, in the London outbreak in the 1850s, 1840s and 1850s, linked the ingestion of contaminated water from the Broad Street pump to the acquisition of cholera. And really, that was the formation of modern public health. Most of modern public health is really around sanitation. So how do you dispose of sewage to prevent disease transmission to another person? And this is really the only diarrheal pathogen. There are many others, uh, Shigella, Salmonella, that you've heard about, perhaps. But this is the only one that really causes worldwide pandemics. The current, or seventh, pandemic uh, began in Asia, as they all do, in 61. It's an endemic disease there. That means it's always there. An epidemic means it then spreads beyond its normal confines. 
and a pandemic that crosses continents primarily, reached Africa in 1970 and then South America in 1991. You may remember only in the 1990s, for those of you who are paying attention at the time, major outbreaks of cholera in Peru and a lot of worry that it was going to arrive in the U.S. As I mentioned, the 0139 appeared in 92, 1992, but is not yet really spread out of Asia. So why that's so, we're not sure, but it certainly has the potential to be the eighth pandemic. Now I mentioned cholera lives in water, and it actually lives in water both in the free form, but also associated with both phyto and zooplankton. So it actually uh, colonizes the surface of those organisms and can uh, digest and eat chitin as a carbon source, chitin, the carbonaceous shell of zooplankton. Just a little map from the WHO tracking uh, over just a single year period to give you a sense of the seventh pandemic. Again, uh, Asia shown here primarily uh, in relation to India, the big green blob there below China, but then you can see involvement of Africa and South America. Notice uh, I'm going to come back to in a, in a moment. Uh, there's a white area that I'm going to return to. It's that area right there. That's the country of Bangladesh. You'll notice that it doesn't have any reported cholera. One of the things I'll mention is that reporting of cholera to the World Health Organization triggers trade sanctions against food exports. So many countries in the world have a lot of cholera. Bangladesh is the most in the world, but choose not to report it, and therefore their products are not sanctioned. So obviously we need to change in those laws to get a bit more accurate summary of what's going on. So cholera lives in water in nature, and um, that's where it undergoes these mutations that I talked about, the acquisition of the O139 serotype from the O1 serotype and others that are I'm not going to go into a lot of molecular biology about cholera. It's a very interesting uh, process. I'm really going to focus on it as a human health problem and what does it teach us about immunology and making a vaccine. That's really what I'm going to try and focus on. But this is where it is. And you can see a woman in Bangladesh getting drinking water for her household. So you can easily imagine why cholera might be prevalent in an area like this. I um, uh, already mentioned this association uh, with plankton. I'll just show you this is a picture. Cholera is here in the green, and basically this is just zooplankton in the environment with cholera on its surface. It also survives in these very interesting forms where you can't culture it. Roberto was just talking about things we can't culture, but we know are there. Cholera actually makes a transition between things you can easily grow and things you can't grow, but you can detect. So if you look for cholera using antibody or DNA, probes, it's clearly there. All right, so I mentioned Bangladesh. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Bangladesh as a country and then the problem with uh, cholera there. So just to remind you, Bangladesh is in that little niche that India surrounds. It was created as a country as East Pakistan when there was partition. And uh, both uh, West and East Pakistan is where the primarily Muslim community went. It was then a a uh, bloody civil war between East and West Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh, which was e East Pakistan, fought for what they would say is their independence and are now an ind independent country renamed Bangladesh in the early 70s. And you can see it's traversed by several rivers and the capital city of Dhaka, unfortunately, is right at the confluence of two rivers. So it floods a lot. Uh, so that's one of the, and I'll show you a picture of some floods from last year that are pretty uh, awesome. Now, at the International Center of Diarrheal Disease Research, that's this ICDDR you'll see on some of my slides, B is Bangladesh. This was set up uh, by many governments many years ago, about 40 years ago, to try and study diarrheal disease and also help the people affected by diarrheal disease. So a lot of research goes on at this facility. And just to give you an idea, this center cares for about 120,000 people a year with diarrheal disease, primarily from the city of Dhaka. So there's a single center in one city. Just to give you an idea, they report no cases of cholera. So obviously that's a misconception. And cholera is seasonal. So this is the months of the year down here, shown interestingly in their bulletin from March to February. I'm not quite sure why they chose that, that axis. And a uh, number of isolates, these are daily, I'm sorry, monthly isolates. And so, they have a big monsoon over the summer period there. And they have a cholera peak that's shown here in blue before and after the monsoon. There's clearly some interesting biology there that's not understood. That is, you can imagine that the peak that follows the monsoon might relate to the fact that there's a lot of flooding 
and therefore there's overflow of sewage into drinking water. Makes good sense. But this is a relatively dry period. So why there's a, a peak there is really not understood. So clearly this is telling us something, but we haven't yet figured out uh, what that would be. If you could go back to the slide, could it yeah. be that the, um, when it's cool and dry, the rotavirus is big, and then as the rotavirus dies off, the cholera can come back? Yes, it's a very interesting hypothesis. Uh, there is a known interaction of rotavirus with cholera, but there is with other organisms that are in the environment. And one are some uh, viruses called bacteriophage that infect cholera. And in fact, at the end of each of these peaks, those come out into the human stool and get rid of the cholera, and then the cholera disappears. So there clearly are some interactions. Not that we recognize with rotavirus, though. And please do interrupt me uh, at all, uh, any time. I just want to show you what happens in an endemic area like Bangladesh that has to struggle with this uh, every year. Uh, and these are just the number of patient visits. These are daily patient visits to the center with diarrheal disease. And I, this is just the month of August comparing 2006, which was a year where they see two or 300 patients a year, as I said, uh, over the course of a year, maybe 100,000. But look at this in the month of August in 2007. Uh, a huge increase, and all of that related to a massive flood that occurred uh, during that period. And during that single month, they cared for 21,000 people, of whom about a third did have cholera, most requiring quite a bit of medical attention. And this is uh, the way cholera is cared for in the developing world, not the way we would necessarily do it in the United States, but patients are cared for on something called a cholera cot. I know that sounds a little disgusting, but basically you lie on a cot which has a hole in the middle and a bucket underneath. And the watery diarrhea that I'm going to describe in a moment goes down there. It's easily measured. Fluid is then repleted. And you can see there are hundreds and hundreds of people in a tent. This is basically a tent that was set up as an emergency place for care. But their normal facility is actually not too much different than this. And this is what the streets in Dhaka look like. So people in Bangladesh deal with this on a yearly basis. This was a particularly bad flood. Um, but you can see that people really can't, they have to stand on things to walk, the water's too deep, and there's their drinking water. And you can easily imagine why cholera was a problem. This particular, you can see, unfortunately, these people have no other water to get, are trying to get their water safely. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the disease. Uh, again, um, I'm going to do that, uh, if, I, if you don't understand a word I say, please make sure I explain that to you. But so, uh, cholera is basically a, a severe watery diarrhea. So you get a lot of diarrhea, and it's essentially all watery. And it can happen uh, very quickly. So within an hour or two, the person can be near death. In fact, I had a colleague that we worked with about 10 years ago, so very unfortunate, but unfortunately true story, who was on a boat coming back from a field station that we maintain, got cholera at the onset of the boat ride, it's about an hour, and was dead before the boat arrived. So it's a, it's a disease that you can imagine struck terror throughout the Middle Ages. If you go to any city in Europe, you'll see cholera columns, uh, which were put there hoping they would fend off cholera and whatnot. We don't see cholera in the US anymore, and that's very thankful. People have lots of cramps, muscle aches, and nausea, and often vomiting, but they don't have fever. So this is not one of the normal diarrheal diseases where you get an infection and fever, and you feel uh, you, ha you have things that reflect an infection. This is different. This is just pure secretion of water out the gut, and if you don't replace the water, you're going to die. There are a number of people who are, have no symptoms or a very mild disease. Of course, we'd like to understand those differences, and I'll show you a few things that we think may start to explain them. Of course, that's what we'd like to reproduce with a vaccine. The fluid that comes out is nearly clear. It's called rice water stool. Rice water, because if you boil rice and then get rid of the rice, it's that kind of cloudy, milky, whitish stuff that looks like rice water. And there are a lot of systemic complications. Again, I won't go into those, but you do have to correct the fluid imbalance quite carefully. So it's probably more useful to show you a picture of what the disease looks like. Obviously, as I said, it affects often children. So poor little kitty, as you can see, he's dramatically dehydrated. If you pick up the skin, that's called tenting. The skin doesn't collapse back down. You can see the child is moribund. Now, the good part of this story, this child was treated and left the hospital four hours later perfectly normal. So cholera is a disease that should have zero mortality treated correctly. Zero mortality. No one should die of this disease. And at the International Center, their mortality of someone who reaches the center is about 
There are a few people that die of medical complications, but not of cholera. And I'll just contrast that with outbreaks that occur in refugee camps in Africa, Rwanda, Mozambique, and others, mortalities of 40 to 50 percent. Same thing we saw in the Middle Ages. So if you know how to treat it, it's a disease that can be cured, but the patient needs to get to the right place. And of course, that's impossible, as you could saw with those floods, who could get to the center when the flood was interrupting transportation. Now, I will tell you uh, an aside, and that is just uh, one of the things that was uh, discovered and uh, has been used at the center in Bangladesh was oral rehydration solution, or ORS. Uh, and this was uh, done primarily by trial and error. That is, people realized if you just gave water, it didn't work. Water just came right out. If you gave salt, salt water, it didn't work, just kind of came out. And so they played around trying to understand why that was. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of physiology, but they realized if you gave the combination of salt, water, and a sugar source, primarily glucose, there's a specific pump in the intestine that is still intact in cholera, and you can therefore take up the fluid if that pump is facilitated. And so ORS was probably, the, many people would say, it's the most important medical advance of the 20th century, even more so perhaps than penicillin. So just in the last uh, uh, two decades, one example is the World Health Organization made the estimate that more than 50 million lives were saved around the world from this very simple uh, salt solution, which is found in almost every house now in the developing world, distributed as packets by the World Health Organization. The primary problem is what do you mix it in? Because of course you're mixing it in contaminated water. That's a bit of a problem. So, Initially, when someone's very ill, you have to give them intravenous fluid. You, you can tell that poor young child wouldn't have been able to drink. But within a few hours, they're awake. You switch them to oral fluid. They go home, and they complete their treatment at home. So that's how cholera is currently treated. Now, there are very few times when time puts not its person of the year, but its medical advance of the year. So its medical advance of the year was, in fact, ORS. This is in 2006. And again, this was the article in which they were quoting these numbers of 50 million lives. Now, I'm going to tell you a lot about treatment of cholera, but since people sometimes ask when I'm talking to an audience like this, it is easily treated, as I said, with fluid and electrolytes, and we do also give antibiotics. I'll mention that in just a moment. You have to put with the oral solution a sugar source, glucose originally used, then addition of some starch, which was then digested to glucose, but shortens diarrheal duration. And now addition of a few extra things that actually do even a little better. But if you just have the standard old glucose ORS, almost uh, as good as anything else, but there are a few improvements. If you take no antibiotics, the infection lasts on its own about six days. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, in an area like Bangladesh, trying to get that amount of fluid into people for six days is a resource limiting problem. They run out of the ORS packets. They run out of IV supplies. And so obviously, if you can shrink the duration of diarrhea, that's a huge help. And that's the only thing antibiotics do. You can treat cholera without an antibiotic if you have enough fluid. If you give an antibiotic and there are a whole bunch that work, you take one single dose, it's very simple. You shrink it by about three days. So again, cholera is a treatable disease if you have fluid. It's shortened duration by a single dose of antibiotic. And so if a person reaches the center, it's not a problem. So why do we need a vaccine for a disease like cholera? The resources in the developing world just diverted to something like cholera and an outbreak prevent the spending of money for all the other things a society needs to do, including education. And so if we can reduce the cost of something like this, it will have a major economic impact, even though in a place like Bangladesh, if you reach the center, you may still do fine. Uh, those who don't reach the center, of course, may not. All right, so I'm going to divert now into a little bit of science, and so I'm going to Again, if I say something you don't understand, just ask me, certainly. So why is it important to understand how cholera causes infection, pathogenesis of the disease? Obviously, you have to understand how the disease is caused to make a vaccine. You can't make a vaccine really without that. Now, of course, in the early period, Pasteur and others made vaccines. They just, they just attenuated things and gave them back to people, and they worked. But many of those vaccines are are not nearly as safe as the ones that we have today. So we have much more targeted vaccine strategies. You really need to know what you need to immune, be immune to and give them nothing else because you don't want an adverse event. That's really, it's a risk-benefit kind of idea. 
there are two things we know in cholera that you must have to get diarrheal disease. These are the two main things. Now, there are hundreds of others people have studied, but these are clearly the two most important. One is you have a pillus. Now, shown here, this is the flagella, so don't mistake that long thing. The pillus are these bundles here. Pili are little things that stick out of bacteria and attach to something. These attach to the gut mucosa. So if you don't have them, the bug washes right through. You can give, in fact, this has been done in a human study. You get rid of the pillus, you can give that to a human, no effect whatsoever. Bug washes right through. So it's a study, thankfully, done only a few number of people. But, uh, secondly, you, there's a big toxin. And the toxin's just shown here with its crystal structure kind of molecularly, but I, I don't want to focus on that. This is a toxin that once the pillus hooks you to the gut, the toxin then acts on the gut cell and makes you secrete fluid. So that's all you need to know. Stick, some toxin. It's a little more complicated than that. And here's a, here's a kind of a cartoon of that. So you, you drink cholera from the water. We've talked about that. It attaches. I didn't show the pillus. It makes the toxin. The toxin has different subunits and certainly some interesting biology. That's the receptor for the toxin on the gut. An individual cell isn't shown. In the cell, inside the cell, it activates adenylate cyclase. Now, we use adenylate cyclase in our cells normally. That is, we regulate it. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, because we want to secrete fluid. This is unregulated, and you overproduce cyclic AMP, this is a signaling molecule within a cell, and the result is basically that you secrete chloride so and sodium and then water follows. So this is a pure secretory diarrhea. So if you could stop things right there, you'd be done. So that's ideally what a vaccine needs to do. Now unfortunately, where I'm showing right there is in the middle of the gut. Now we know pretty well how to get vaccines and antibody in blood. We all get flu, or hopefully you are getting your flu vaccine. We all get vaccines that act in the blood. We're pretty good at that. We're not very good at asking, how do we get an antibody that works here? So that's the biologic question. I'm going to just tell you a little bit of approach to that. Again, thinking about how you would think about these kinds of questions. Yes? So you're saying that the vaccine has to get into the gut. I, mean, can you, I guess I just quite So the vaccine itself doesn't need to get into gut but the effect of the vaccine has to be implemented in the gut because the cholera never moves outside the gut. It is outside the body, inside the gut. Now, I guess that's a semantic issue, but it is not in our body. Flu is in our body. Blood is fine. Cholera never sees blood. So we have to get an antibody that goes into there. So we have to get the antibody outside of the body into, into the, the gut. Correct. All right, so I'm just going to tell you a few snippets of how you would think about some of these problems. I'm not going to try and tell you everything that's worked on. I actually, I don't know if you got an article I sent you uh, that has a little bit about cholera vaccines, a few years old, but it was a reasonably recent kind of overview. And I'm going to talk about, if you look at what happens when the bug enters a person, that's this interaction of an individual and the organism, I'm going to just comment, make a few comments about things that are specific to the bug, Things that are in the environment I'm not going to talk about. I've already shown you why there's a huge inoculum. I'm not going to really talk more about that. But I am going to talk about what we can do in the host. And obviously in a vaccine, what we want to do is establish an immune response that's effective. That's an adaptive immune response. That is one you see after an organism. I'll just give you a couple of quick snippets at the end that there are very important differences in people who is susceptible or not. That may explain why we see people are asymptomatic with the same exposure as people who die. And clearly, nutritional factors are very important, and there are many others. But I'm just going to give you a few snippets in those areas. The first snippet I'm going to give you is about the pathogen. Now, so when cholera infects a person, it then comes out in the stool. So cholera's life cycle is entirely predicated on getting itself in the stool to infect the next person. Now, obviously, it's not thinking that way, but that if you think of what would evolution select, it would select something that spreads to the next person. And one of the things that we've recognized recently is that cholera that goes in the person, that came from water, is not the same as cholera that comes out of the person. Even though the bacteria is the same, you grow it on the media, it looks the same, it is now changed in the genes that it expresses. And it has a phenotype that's called hyperinfectivity. And this is very important epidemiologically. That means the first person who drinks cholera has to drink about 10 to the 8th organisms to get an infection. 
a lot of bacteria. The next person whose that stools contaminated their water, they drink a thousand times less and get cholera. So the cholera is now more infectious for the next person. So this idea of hyperinfectivity, and it's not just in the stool. If you then take the stool, you do it immediately, you get that phenotype. If you put it in pond water in Bangladesh for five hours, it's still there. Not shown on the slide, we've now done it for 24 hours. It's still there. You lose it after 24 hours. So what that means is, if you're in an environment where you're likely to get somebody else's stool in your water within 24 hours, you're much higher risk in that environment for cholera. So the key in interrupting cholera isn't to interrupt it forever. It's just to delay transmission by 24 hours. And then the infectious dose goes up a thousand fold, and more people are protected just by natural consequences. Now, can you actually show that that makes a difference? And I'll show you a slide that, that shows that. First, I'll just show you one slide of data. So this is a competitive competition index just means you take bugs that were going into the person, or in this case were grown in laboratory media, versus bugs that came out of the person. And then you put the two together and you ask, does one infect better than the other? 10 times means it infected 10 times better, 100 times, 1,000 times. These are just six different people, basically done lots of different ways. So you can see that it's always 100 to 1,000 fold, occasionally maybe 10 fold, but certainly more infectious. Now, there's a lot of discussion. Would that really make a difference? It makes a lot of conceptual sense, certainly, and it certainly holds in the laboratory. And this is actually done by mathematical modeling. So this is not an experiment. This is an, this is a, this is a, a, an equation. What happens in Bangladesh when you see cholera is you get one patient, and then you get an explosive outbreak through the whole population over a week. Unbelievable, the whole city. How could that possibly happen? If you don't have this hyperinfectivity and model transmission, so the next person gets it, the next person, that kind of thing, this would be the epidemic curve predicted by the model. You see it peaks at around 1,000, and it takes almost a half a year to get to a peak. That's not what we see. If you add hyperinfectivity, once you get one person, a thousand times more people will get it. Then you get an explosive outbreak that peaks in the first week or two and goes up to lots of people. So this mathematical model seems to suggest that this phenotype may actually be relevant in human disease transmission. So that's all I'm going to tell you about that particular area, because now I'm going to move more a bit to the vaccine side. All right, so what do we know about immunity? Whenever you're thinking of a vaccine, the first question anyone would ask is, if you get infected yourself, are you protected? Because we're not likely to do too much better than natural infection. That's not absolutely true. There are better vaccines than a natural infection can provide. A good example is the pneumococcal vaccine, Pneumovax, or one of the newer variants of that you might have heard of, if you couple the capsule of the organism to a protein carrier, you actually get better immunity than the bug itself gives you. So you can do better than nature, but there are relatively few examples. So certainly you want to ask if you get the infection and you never yourself protect it, that's a, that's a high hurdle to climb. HIV, unfortunately, is a perfect example. People with HIV are not themselves protected. Therefore, to make a vaccine that does protect, obviously, is going to be much more difficult than just immunizing as nature would normally do. So what do we know about natural cholera? Well, in the US, there are, in fact, volunteer trials where people ingest cholera. They're in a research ward. They're treated right away. They usually aren't very ill. And we know that if you do that, they are protected for about three years. If you go in an endemic setting, the susceptibility to disease decreases with age. So that makes you assume that if people got it infected once as they age, then they're less susceptible. That's the pattern you'd expect with natural immunity. And I'll show you the graph of this uh, um, average immunity after cholera, but in Bangladesh, it wanes to about 50% at six years. That is perfectly reasonable for a vaccine. We could clearly dose a vaccine every five years if we could reproduce that. So the question is answered. If we could get a vaccine that reproduces natural infection, we'd be okay. The current vaccines, I'll just tell you there are many, including one that Harvard made, and that are in field trials in Bangladesh. We know they only give protection for a year. A, year, a yearly vaccine in a place like Bangladesh would never work. To vaccinate someone every year, like we get flu vaccine, just think of the hassles we all go through to get our flu vaccine, never would, never would work. 
So we need a longer lasting vaccine. But natural infection does it pretty well. Now this is just the curve, basically. I'm, this is an arbitrarily defined immunity level. I won't tell you what it is. The higher it is, the more immune you are. And this is just years after infection. I just want to show you that basically this arbitrary immunity level hits 50% at about six years. So that's the data I was just telling you in a large field trial. All right, so Bangladesh represents a great place to study this. And this is not a question that's unique to Bangladesh or even unique to the developing world. We have our own problems with similar pathogens, just not cholera here. So it does represent an opportunity to make a difference in a country that needs help and learn ourselves something. That's why the NIH here funds the studies, because they realize it's important for us as well as for the developing world. And we have a number of studies we've been doing now over almost a decade. We've uh, taken a number, uh, lots of people with cholera and followed them. In our original studies, we followed them for a short period, to ask what happened right after infection. And then what we would do is we would go to their household. Within a household, the risk of getting cholera, if somebody in your household has it, is 30% in the next week. Obviously a pretty high risk. So we enter those people immediately, and then we follow them. If they get cholera, of course, then we're right there to treat them. But then we can also ask, the ones who got cholera versus the ones who didn't, what's different about them? How could we have predicted that, and therefore what do we need to reproduce if we had a good vaccine? And these people we follow for three weeks. And then in the context, we collect a whole bunch of things about them that might be useful in predicting protection. We've extended that now to be following people not for, for 30 days, but for a year. So one of the more recent uh, uh, topics in, in immunology is called memory. And maybe you've heard about immunologic memory. It's a very hot area. Normally, when we develop uh, an immune response, some fraction of our cells are long-lived memory for re-exposure. Some are effector cells that are there to fight off and kind of die off when the job's done. So we are, obviously, we're interested. Do people with cholera get memory? Because the only way you could get immunity for six years is if you had memory. You have to have memory, presumably, for that. Because all the other mechanisms that we know about go away over a much shorter period of time. And I'll show you some of those. We're also doing a study that is a bit more invasive. Now, when you do human studies, of course, you do a lot of uh, careful control uh, things to make sure this is done safely. But so 18 people who have cholera come to the center when they are treated and stabilized. So on the second day, they would about be about to go home at that point. They undergo what many of us have, that is an endoscopy. You look in the stomach and you take a little biopsy of the duodenum. Because now what we're looking for is right where the cholera is, what immune response do they have there? And then they return at three months, I'm sorry, at, six month, at 30 days, six months, and 12 months to see how long those things last. Obviously, to participate in this study, they and their families get some medical help and some other things that, uh, that they find helpful to themselves. All right, so what do we know about contacts? And now I'm going to again show you a little bit of data. The first, this is when we were just doing the 21-day observation, and I'm just showing the data on the first group of contacts. As I said, there's a large number, maybe 30 percent, who clearly have infection in the household. There's another group that may well be infected, but we didn't really detect it. So it actually may be much higher than 30 percent, but it's at least this number. Of those who get infected, 143, or about three quarters, got sick. They need to be treated. They are not protected in the way we want them. So they're the group that doesn't have what we want. These people were entirely asymptomatic. They got cholera, they cleared the organism, and had no symptoms. Whatever they have is what we want. So here we have two groups. These numbers have to be bigger, to be honest, to answer the questions we're studying, and now they are much bigger. So I'm just showing you some earlier data. Now, the first thing we saw was that there was a clear uh, relationship with age. So the risk of cholera, probability of getting it in the household, so notice this is 45 percent if you're very young, drops down here well under 20 percent, even 10 percent if you're old. Everyone knew this. So this just reconfirmed the thing worked. Because if you, we didn't see protection by age, then we would have been really worried. We knew that was supposed to be true. So it's a pretty easy trend line to see. No effect of gender. No effect, not, I'm sorry, that's, that's 010139. No effect of gender. This line is even just like that one. So it isn't a male or female thing. So we'd hope that might be part of the reason. Now, the next thing we found is that 
There is an antibody response. This is an antibody response that's been measured for, for ever since cholera was described, so more than 100 years. You basically add the blood of a person and the bacteria dies. It's called vibriocidal because the vibrio is killed, vibriocidal. We've known for years that that predicts protection. And in fact, we could show the odds ratio just means, or the, the p-value just means it's a highly significant protection. So we knew if the person, the contact, had this antibody present, they were protected. And I'm going to show you why that, unfortunately, isn't useful in a minute. What we didn't know, and that's shown in these three lines here, the IgA, and I've just highlighted the significant numbers in blue here for you. If the person had pre-existing antibody of the IgA isotype, now there are different kinds of antibodies, IgG is in our blood, IgA goes to secretions, gut, saliva, reproductive tract. If they had that kind of antibody, they were protected. So that's exactly what you would have thought, right? If they have antibody going in the gut to the right protein, they should be protected. So that's just what we saw here. So again, that was reassuring, but not previously shown in a person, just shown in mice and so forth. Now I mentioned this serum vibriocidal antibody, this antibody where things get killed. And this is the one-year study of a much larger number of contacts. This is, day two is when the contact is entered, so they're not yet ill. They have a very low titer, and again, the baseline titer in normal people in Bangladesh who've seen cholera before is about this level of 64. It's expressed in reciprocal dilutions. On day seven, they now are sick, they get a huge bump up. I'm sorry, these are not contacts, these are cases, I'm sorry. Huge bump up, but what I want you to see is that by day 360, a year, it is basically back to baseline. So while the vibricidal predicts protection, it clearly doesn't explain six-year protection. So if somebody has a vibricidal antibody and they're protected, it's because they had cholera fairly recently, and that's why they're protected. But looking for the vibricidal is not the way to make a vaccine. And unfortunately, all current vaccine trials, this is the approved marker. So that's not, that's gonna have to change. This is a short-lived immune response that's not gonna be okay. Now what about if you look at antibody? And here I'm just showing antibody of the IgG class, specific to the cholera toxin that I mentioned was an important virulence factor. Again, when they come in, they have very low levels of antibody. This is just a relative ELISA unit scale. Goes up on day seven, but very rapidly falls. So again, antibody, as you know, disappears fairly quickly. This is not immunologic memory. If you look at that over a longer period, and I know this uh, didn't reproduce well, hopefully you can see it from the back, but I'll tell you what's on it. So this is a year, and up here is IgA antibody, down here IgG antibody, and what I want you to see is basically, quickly, these are fairly back to baseline. So again, while IgA predicted protection, it's a short-lived, little longer than vibricidal, but not long enough. These do not explain what we need to do with the vaccine. The next thing I'm going to tell you about is an assay that's used for mucosal immunity. Now, mucosal immunity you may or may not have studied. I don't know. It's a, it's a less studied area of immunity. It is the, ant the antibodies that act in the gut, in the mucosal surface. And we don't have a good way of measuring that. We don't put a tube in people's gut and, and draw an antibody. We can do it in the blood. So this is a way to get at it. Now, how does, how does that work? This is called the antibody secreting cell assay, and it just reminds you of how mucosal immunity uh, is formed. When you infect the gut, there are lymphocytes that sit under the gut mucosa. Antigen goes to those and is delivered by an antigen-presenting cell to the lymphocyte. The lymphocyte that recognizes that antigen is then stimulated to grow. It then enters the circulation and goes in the blood. In the blood, it then expresses a cell surface molecule that puts it back to the gut. And then it goes back to the gut, matures, and that's where it secretes the IgA antibody that I told you was part of the protection at the gut surface. So that's the, that's the normal way we make mucosal immune responses. In the blood, on day seven, after an acute exposure, are these lymphocytes specific for the antigen circulating? And then they go back to the gut. So the obvious question along the lines I've just been asking, if you have cholera, do, you do those cells circulate and do they last? Are they there? Are they the explanation we're looking for? 
So this is an assay called the antibody secreting or ASC assay. It's very simple, you just take blood, you isolate peripheral blood mononuclear cells, PBMC, and I'm not gonna go through the details, but basically you're looking for antibody on the surface of these cells specific to the protein you're looking for. Very simple test, you just read it as number of spots. So if you do that in someone with cholera, and I'll do it again for the cholera toxin response, again, some people on day two already have some of those cells circulating. And when you go back in their histories, they've actually been ill for a few days. They've not been ill at all, there's no cells. But they appear by day seven, but they are gone really quickly. So again, this is a good correlate of immune response, but it's not a good correlate of protection because it's gone. And where did it go? It went back into the gut mucosa because that's where it's gonna protect on the next exposure. All right, so then the last immunologic concept I'm gonna introduce you to is a memory B cell. Uh, so those same antigen-stimulated lymphocytes that we just talked about divide. One of the divisions produces a cell that then matures to secrete antibody called a plasma cell. That's what goes back in the gut and makes the antibody. But the other division makes a long-lived memory cell, memory B cell, that's there for the next exposure. These allow a rapid so-called anamnestic response. That is, when you see the infection again, you have an immune response very quickly, much quicker than the primary infection. These, no, these unfortunately, are present in very low numbers in the circulation. You just couldn't draw your blood and see those cells at all. So you need to figure out a way to find them. And there is now an assay to develop over the last few years to do this. You basically take out all the B cells that are in the blood, and then you stimulate them so they all grow, and then you look and see if any of the ones you're looking for might be present. So that's a quick summary of this assay. And this had never been done at the, for a gut pathogen like cholera or any diarrheal disease pathogen. So this is at 30 days. And these are memory cells that are specifically recognizing from the blood of someone with cholera, the cholera toxin, and this is a control. These should always be negative. So you see these are always negative, that's good, assay works. Nothing there on day two, day 30, day 90. Oh, that looks encouraging, pretty, pretty level line there. So that looked encouraging enough, that's when we went to the one year study. We said we need to know if this is what is stimulated. Again, a somewhat difficult slide to see in the back, 360 days, cholera toxin specific memory B cells, on the top, the IgA type that we know is going back to the gut, IgG staying in the blood, pretty good. This is, in fact, a long-lasting immune response now to a year. So what we think we need is a memory B cell response, probably of this IgA type that goes back to the gut on exposure. So we're now trying to work with the World Health Organization to redefine what you test in cholera vaccines to see if that's produced. Now there's a wrinkle. I showed you that for cholera toxin. This is for that pillows. I'm not sure exactly what happened. These aren't quite, uh, we haven't read all of the plates on day 30, but pretty much the same. They last. Those are two protein antigens. The body responds very different to protein antigens than it does from polysaccharide antigens. So we're interested in a polysaccharide antigen. I told you one of the polysaccharides is the lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, that defines the O1 serotype and is part of the vibricidal response. So you should have antibody to that, and it at least gives you short life protection. If you look at memory cells to those, they start to go away. You see here, they're both starting to tail off. Now, what, I'm only gonna tell you the hypothesis of why that's important. What is needed to get long-lived memory B cells are long-lived memory T cells. Remember, there are two parts of the immune system, the cellular immune and the antibody-producing cells. T helper cells are necessary to maintain the life of a B cell, and a memory B cell included. So now the obvious question is, do you get a memory T cell response in cholera? We have preliminary data that you do, and is that what you're missing in the current vaccine? And we have pretty good data that that is, in fact, correct. Were that hypothesis uh, proven true, then it's a very simple biologic problem. There are things you can add to a vaccine that stimulate T cell memory, and they're not in the current cholera vaccines. So by understanding the basic biology, and I know I've given you a little bit more perhaps basic biology than 
that you want. I just want you to understand how you'd ask this question and then answer it in a way that might be generalizable. Same thing would hold, by the way, for HIV infection. So just a few conclusions from that piece, and then I'll show you one other piece of data and then stop. So patients with natural cholera do develop memory B cells specific for those antigens. The two protein antigens, which are dependent on T cells, persist for more than a year. That's probably what we need. But the ones that are specific for a polysaccharide, and these do not depend on T cells, go away by a year. So that's a clue that T cells may be important. And so the obvious questions that I already phrased is, might T cell memory be important? And if it's important, might it explain the difference in the memory response between infection and vaccination? I'm just going to show you two other quick snippets just to show you there are other things going on, but not go into them in any detail. These are in patients, uh, contacts of patients with cholera and their risk of infection by different variables. And I've already shown you the ones that are important. If they are deficient in vitamin A, they are twofold more likely to get cholera than someone who's not vitamin A deficient. Vitamin A is now given routinely to all children around the world in resource limited settings, partly for this reason. And we now know the immunologic basis for that, but I won't go into that. If you are the first degree relative of a case, you also have an almost threefold increased risk of getting cholera in the same household. So there undoubtedly are genetic polymorphisms in the human population that put you at risk. And one of the people working in our group actually knows what a few of those are. Those, unfortunately, you can't do anything about because you can't change your genes. But by understanding them, you might better understand what it is cholera interacts with that might lead to an alteration in therapy. Yes? So are you saying that someone who's in the household but related only by marriage, for instance, does not have the same risk? That's correct. So first degree relatives, so basically mother, father, sibling, child, versus other people, including second degree relatives, cousins, uh, grandparents, and unrelated marriage and so forth. Yes, so you control by household, and then you ask what's the risk by genetics. This takes lots of people. So are you saying that O, o blood type is protective? Yes, actually. We knew there was some genetic predisposition because in fact it's been known for a long time that if you have this O blood group, you are protected from getting cholera. And in fact, the O blood group is very rare in Asia where cholera is endemic and is much more prevalent here in our country where we don't have a lot of cholera. We don't really know what it is about the O blood group or is it in fact the protective mechanism or is it linked to the protective mechanism? So this was just a clue that there was some genetics going on. We now know a little bit more about those genetics, but the ones we found are not yet linked to O blood group. Yes? Uh, about the chloride puff initially, the mechanism, how does, I don't know, cystic fibrosis also acts on chloride pumps Yes. Yeah. some indication. Yes, so the, the channel through which the sodium chloride is exported is in fact the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein. So ostensibly people with cystic fibrosis would be protected from cholera. It's a hard experiment to do. They have lots of other problems, unfortunately. And it was at one point hypothesized that the reason the cystic fibrosis was selected for it, its prevalence in the population was as a protective way against cholera. The only thing against that is cystic fibrosis is prevalent in northern Europeans, not in Asians, but cholera is in Asians. So it doesn't make a whole lot of biologic sense. But it made a big splash in science a few years ago. Wasn't it there in the Middle Ages? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It was there in the Middle Ages. But again, presumably to select a gene in the human population would take generations and generations. And it's possible there's enough selective pressure for that to occur rapidly. But that would only be a few hundred years. Remember, it didn't get to, to Europe to the mid-1800s. Remember, Asia for thousands of years, Europe in the first pandemic. All right, so I'll just close with a couple of things. So obviously, safe water would be the most useful around the world. We'd all understand that. But it's logistically hard, not undoable. I mean, if the world put its mind to it, we could do this. But of course, there's too many distractions. We're going to give $700 billion right now. That would buy everyone clean water. I won't go there politically. A vaccine. The trouble getting out and keeping Bangladesh from being underwater entirely. Yes, <laughs> that, that's true. In fact, they're kind of worried about that. A vaccine obviously would be very helpful. Managing the cases correctly, which is really just public health education, and preparing the community that is working in partnerships. All of those are part of the strategy and many other things. So for my final conclusions, I've 
talk to you about how cholera is a model pathogen to study mucosal immunity. And most of the things you look at are too short-lived to explain long-lasting immunity. But immunologic memory and how to understand that seems to be the next area that we really want to work on. So I always close just so that because the people who work with us in Bangladesh, this is a picture of us with our group on the, on the roof of the International Center. Uh, but these people take care of uh, hundreds of people every day with cholera. So they really deserve lots of recognition for anything that they do. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes. Anyone who needs to leave certainly do so. Yes. This is just basic biology. What is the molecular difference between a, a B um, antibody producing cell and a B helper cell and a B memory cell? So uh, a, a B lymphocyte that's resting is basically ready to be stimulated. Once it's stimulated, it bifurcates to, to be one that will go on to mature to be an antibody secreting cell or a plasma cell. The other develops a memory cell and now lives for a much longer time. So if you're there as a B lymphocyte and never get stimulated, you'll die off. But those that are stimulated last for a longer period. And we constantly make new B cells. What is the difference between the plasma cells and the memory cells? Is that known at the molecular level? So the, me the plasma cell actually makes and secretes antibody. It is an effector why? cell. My question is why? I mean, do they know why a memory cell is different from a plasma cell when they come from the same cell? So it, it, obviously the genetics of the cells are identical. It's what genes are expressed. So there's a rearrangement of the antibody uh, so that it makes a mature antibody. It goes, undergoes something called class switching. So it first has antibody in its surface, then it remakes a different kind of antibody. It has IgM on its surface, then it makes IgG and IgA and some others, and then it secretes those. So basically those are just additional genes it expresses during development to become a differentiated cell. The memory cell doesn't work through it. Memory cell doesn't do that. It's waiting to do that. It's waiting to mature at a later point. So once you mature it, it's a dead end. Yes, sir. Is, um, is the memory cell, does it have a preference to go to IgG over IgA? Is that part of the, 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 the challenge? So it may be. So certainly all the previous work or most of the previous work on memory cells is focused just on IgG because a lot of work is on blood immunity and those are very easy to measure. Very little work done previously on IgA memory cells. In fact, this may be either the first or perhaps the second that I know about. So we don't know those as well, so I can't really answer. But one of the things vitamin A does, I will tell you this since you asked the question, Class type switching from IgM and IgG to IgA is stimulated by vitamin A. So one of the reasons people in the developing world may be more susceptible if they're vitamin A deficient may have to do with an immunologic event. So you need something that might, that might push it more towards the IgA. Yes. And maybe they're doing plenty of IgG, but you can push it to the IgA. Yes, I, I agree with that. Yeah, there's obviously lots of things we need to understand better. Yes. You mentioned HIV really briefly in your T helper cell. Is there any potential for extrapolating from here to HIV? Well, so, so obviously one of the problems with HIV is you have a chronic infection, but you're not immune. So the question of, is why? When you transmit HIV, at least by the sexual route, it is a mucosal infection. You need the same kind of protection as you do for cholera, in a different location perhaps, but the same fundamental idea. So yes, people are, a lot, are very interested in the idea of what could we do to get memory at the mucosal surface in someone as part of a vaccine strategy. Part of the problem is HIV infects the, C help, the T helper cells that are needed for the memory. So that's something that will be hard to overcome. Cholera, of course, doesn't do that. So HIV has the same problem, but it has an added problem that it kills the memory cells you might want to stimulate. So what we have to do is get a vaccine earlier before the CD4 cells are infected and get mucosal memory. So presumably that would be one of the routes. Yes? I was wondering, uh, Vibrio is famous for, well, it was like the model system for showing communication between bacteria. Mm -hmm. Is that like the reason behind the development of hyperinfectivity? So the hyperinfectivity seems to be a single organism phenomenon. That is, if you take a single organism and, and put it in a milieu like a mouse, it will develop that property. There are lots of other cell-cell communications that, involve, that in, occur in Vibrio. And that, Roberto is one of the world's experts on biofilms. I don't know if he talked about that. He wasn't talking, I guess, when I came in about that. But, so biofilms are the classic community of bacteria assembled often on a cell surface. 
And color clearly does that on the surface of zooplankton and phytoplankton. I showed you a picture of that. It may do that in the gut. And now, in fact, we can see in human stool clumps that look like biofilm organisms that are very different physiologically. And there's even some data that those are the hyperinfectious organisms. So it may be a single cell develops, but maybe as part of that, they then clump and become more infectious. So there may be an interaction. Um, I went to lecture a while at Ruth Calder, is that her name? That, that worked in Bangladesh, and, and mm -hmm. not, she's not a medical doctor, but. Call, Rita Caldwell. Oh, yeah. And about how just filtering the drinking water with mm -hmm. mechanical filter decreased, not, not eliminated, of course, but yes. decreased. Yes, absolutely. So remember, if cholera as an organism is too small for that to work, but if it's on those zooplankton, which it is in water, those are big enough that they're, that they're filtered out. And so women in Bangladesh now, when they get their water, most who are well educated, they fold their saris, they fold them eight times, and then pour the water into their drinking vessel. And it reduces about 50, maybe even 60% cholera. So very simple intervention, absolutely.